Hello, I'm Healy Herzog, and I help out with video here at Canyon Hills. Whether you're joining us in person or tuning in online, we're happy to have you with us for worship today. This Memorial Day weekend, we want to take a moment to honor those who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom. To those of you who have lost a loved one, we sincerely thank you for all that you have given for our freedom, and our prayers are with you today. We have a couple of exciting things coming up soon, such as the Discover Canyon Hills membership class on Saturday, June 4th. If you're looking to become a member or want to learn more about our beliefs and core values, this class is the perfect opportunity for you. Go to our website or the Canyon Hills app to register. The week after that on Friday, June 10th is our next night of worship. It's always a privilege to be able to gather together as a church and lift up the name of Jesus on these nights. Be sure to save the date and join us. Thanks for listening. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and praise His name together now. Well, good morning, Canyon Hills. We are glad that you are here. Um, we're starting off a little bit different, a little bit on a heavier note. Um, I just want to acknowledge the horrible tragedy that happened in Texas um, last week and the weight that you guys might be feeling, the weight that I know that we're all feeling, the weight that the nation is feeling through this. Um, it's hard to know exactly what to say or to do when things like this happen, but I know um, for us at, at Cannon Hills, we're going to do what we do. We're going to worship God, and in a few minutes, we are going to um, pray for these families in this community. There's a couple of verses that I want to share before we start singing that have brought me encouragement, and I want to share them with you. In Psalm 91, 1 and 2, it says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And I love that we have this, um, this truth that our God is our fortress and um, our refuge and He is our hope when things feel very hopeless. So today we are going to rest in the presence of the Almighty One. We're going to worship our God through the pain and the sorrow and the confusion and the anger. We're going to fix our eyes back on Him um, and we're going to worship Him with all we've, all we've got. So I'm going to invite you to get to your feet. Would you sing loud with us? Would you fix your eyes on Jesus with us today?
We're gonna linger a little longer in just the spirit of worship and the spirit of prayer as we take some time to acknowledge and to pray about these things that have happened in our country over the last several weeks in Texas and in New York and other places. So I'm gonna ask you to just quietly take your seat. We never make it a habit around here to allow media headlines to dictate our agenda when we come together to worship, but there are times, there are times when our tears and our mourning are not only appropriate, but they are shared amongst all of us, not just us here, but 
for believers all around our country. The tears and the mourning that we feel, the, the anger, the fear, the confusion that we feel, it's all in line with the heart of God for his people. And there are so many grieving. And what I want us to do is I, wanna, I want us to accept Jesus' invitation to all who are weary and heavy hearted to come to him to come to him. Let's bow our heads. Dear compassionate, merciful, heavenly Father, it is so comforting to know that you hate evil so much that you were willing to send Jesus, your son, to die in order to save us from all this evil and to save us forever. Oh God, we are comforted to know that you see our sorrow. You see our tears and your word tells us that you actually collect them in heaven's bottles, never to be forgotten by you. God, you promise that someday you will wipe away all of our tears forever and ever. church, just in your own space right now, I want us to pray for the parents and the families who are in deep grief and sorrow for their loved ones, their lost ones, both parents and families of children, of the teachers who were slain, of the innocent people who were shopping in a grocery store in New York. Let's pray that God would somehow, in only ways that he can, visit them with some sense of relief and comfort. Church, let's keep praying for teachers, both the teachers in that school and teachers all over our country right now who never ever dreamed that they would have to be a part of such horror. Pray that they would be restored. Pray that God would renew their high calling to teach, to give them courage and to give them peace. Pray for our teachers. Oh God, we, we pray for our first responders, for our law enforcement, and all that are connected to moments like this. God, we confess that we can't even begin to understand the burden that they carry, the responsibility that they carry. God, we pray right now for all of them. God, that you would make them brave that you would give them courage to return to their post. That God, you would remind them that you are on your throne and that you have called them and that you will provide for them what they need. God, we can't even imagine how horrifying that alarm must sound when they receive it, to go to things like this. But they keep going. God, thank you for them. And God, we all just humble ourselves before you and we confess 
our own sin. We confess, God, our own desperate need for your grace every day. We praise you, God, that by faith and in your grace, you are changing us. You are sanctifying us. You are transforming our hearts, God, that these kinds of evils shall never reside in our hearts again. Lord, thank you for doing that work. And we pray, God, for opportunities to share the hope and to share the understanding, to share the peace that we have knowing, God, who you are and what you are like and what you have done to provide for us, especially in moments like this. We love you, Lord, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Well, thank you for participating in this. These are the things that we have to do together. And this is one of the, one of the many uh, blessings that we come to church. We mourn with those who mourn and we rejoice with those who rejoice. Amen. And this is one of those mourning days. Let's open our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you're new today, this is a great time to get started with us at Canyon Hills. We go through books in the Bible on Sunday mornings because we sincerely believe that the Bible actually is God's Word. And it serves us as the source of all of God's loving authority and truth and wisdom for our lives and for our lives of faith in Him. Last Sunday, we spent the morning introducing the book of Ecclesiastes and Solomon, who authored it. And if you weren't here, I, I, I hope you will go back and listen to last Sunday's message online. I rarely ever say that, but I believe it will help you and it will help make sense of these next couple of months of Sundays. It'll help them to come alive. Now, if you were here last Sunday, I, I kind of challenged you to, with a couple of us homework assignments, one of which was to go home last week and read the whole book of Ecclesiastes before you got back here today. Now, remember... You can't lie in church, but I'm going to ask you, those of you who were here, how many of you actually had a chance to attempt that and you actually got through the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes? Let me see. Good for you. How many of you got through it before this morning? I just want to know. Some of you, you were reading it out in the car when you pulled into the parking lot, right? No, that's good. Because if you've done that, you are already beginning to see kind of this journey that Solomon is going to take us on. As I mentioned, Ecclesiastes at its core is a book about worship. It's not about how to worship or styles of worship, but about what and who not to worship. And what's at stake if we don't get that right is our own happiness. If we don't understand who and what not to worship, what's at stake is our, really our understanding of what the God-given purpose and meaning of our life is all about. And so there is a lot at stake here as we strive to understand what the Holy Spirit moved Solomon to tell us and teach us. If your Bibles are open to Ecclesiastes 1, I'm going to make you stand one more time. I know you just settled in. You got everything just right. But we stand for the reading of God because we anticipate that when God's word is read, God's voice is heard. And so we want to stand and Respect and anticipation of that. Let's begin in first, verse 1, chapter 1. Solomon is saying all these words that he has written that we are reading are the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and it hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and it goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams actually run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. 
Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. Mm, It has been already in the ages before us. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Father, I pray that you will help us not only to understand what you have had Solomon write, but to believe that it matters for our lives today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Be seated. What I find interesting right off the top is that Solomon doesn't reveal his name in the opening comments there in verse 1. His name Solomon literally means peace. But as we found last week, Solomon himself was anything but at peace. He was far from peace. His sin had brought much trouble into his own life as well as the kingdom of God's people. His guilt and his shame were completely depleted. And any peace between him and God had long since vanished. And so in the opening, he identifies himself as the preacher, the son of David and king the king in Jerusalem. And I I just want to focus on preacher for our time. Uh, Many serious Bible teachers believe that this title that he chose to identify himself with, preacher, is an indication that after decades of backsliding and God dishonoring idolatry and immorality, that he had actually gathered himself and, and came home to God. And I believe by the time he wrote this, his life had a much higher calling which would explain why the title of preacher precedes the royalty, the royalty titles of being the son of David and the king of Israel. Solomon's repentance is such an example for us that it's never too late. No matter how far you have drifted and wandered and walked away from God, it is never too late to repent and come back to God because we believe this, right? We believe that God's grace turns great sinners into great converts. We believe that, right? But we also believe that God's grace turns great backsliders into grateful prodigals. There's always a way back to God when we blow it. And it's through the door of his grace. And the key, the only key that opens the door of God's grace is genuine, honest, humble repentance that seeks to restore God's name and to repair the damage that our foolishness has caused to others. And in the end, I believe Solomon does both. Ecclesiastes is Solomon restoring God's name and it's repairing the damage that his sinful reign over God's people had caused. He had led so many astray into idolatry and immorality by his example and lifestyle. And Ecclesiastes is his re- him restoring the name of God and repairing that damage. And so let's get started. Solomon begins with the summation of everything that his backsliding taught him. In verses 2 and right away, he's telling us nothing under the sun is sufficient to make us or keep us happy. In other words, the world with all of its delights has nothing that truly satisfies This is the thesis statement of the whole book of Ecclesiastes, which he's about to spend 12 chapters urgently trying to convince us to believe. As I mentioned last week, Solomon lived the American dream, and he told us it was a dead-end street long before there was an American dream. That's Solomon's life. And now he's holding nothing back. History's wisest fool is going to tell the uncensored truth about everything pleading with us to not make the same mistakes that he did. And the sad thing, the sad thing is that so many people will refuse to believe him. Some of you, if you stick around through this series, some of you are going to decide, yeah, Solomon mm, didn't get it right. I pray that not be so. Look at verse 2, five times in one sentence, he uses the word vanity. Some of your Bibles translate that word meaningless, same word. That Hebrew word for vanity is actually the word for vapor or smoke. He is saying there are no relationships, no amount of riches, and, and no amount of success in this life that's going to make us and keep us happy. 
Solomon saw it all. He did it all. He bought it all. He experienced every known moral and immoral pleasure that the world could possibly offer. And so it's with absolute conviction that he concludes in verse 2, all is vanity. And not only vanity, but vanity of vanities. It's vanity in the highest degree. Blaise Pascal looks at Solomon in this section, and he calls this a life pursuit that is empty, petty, thin, and hollow. And this will be the condition of every person seeking happiness without God. This is the modern pagan today. Chasing happiness at full steam without God. And so in verse 3, Solomon says, there's no amount of effort that will ever prove this wrong. Like a hamster wheel. The harder you work at chasing your happiness and your satisfaction, the farther away it goes. And verse 3, is, it's a rhetorical question. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? He's not confused. He knows the answer. You gain nothing. You will never gain on happiness. You can never catch up to it. It's like vapor. As soon as you think you have it, it eludes you. And no one's hard work has ever succeeded in being able to capture happiness. Now, look at verse 12. We stopped right before it, but look at verse 12. He says, I, the preacher, listen, I've been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything, everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. It's a striving after the wind. It's as if Solomon is saying this. He's, it's, I, I, I hear him saying, listen, if me, the wisest, richest, and most creative person who's ever lived before and we know after him, then why do you think you can do it? I, I, I sense that Solomon is saying that. The one who had the most money and the most wisdom ever is telling us, you never catch it. No matter how hard you try. So don't think that you can if I could. No amount of effort will ever prove that wrong. And in verse 4, he's basically saying there's no end to how many people have tried. And I would add, keep trying. In verse 4, Solomon's saying every generation thinks it's going to succeed at what every generation before us failed at. That's what he means here. He's saying a generation goes and a generation comes and they keep not believing me. <laughs> they keep trying. They're going to keep trying. And so then he adds at the end of verse four, but the earth remains forever. In other words, when we die, two things are true. They are for sure. When we die, we leave the earth behind us. And the world just keeps on spinning without us. In fact, the earth, the world, it won't even miss us when we're gone. It's just relentless. It just keeps on spinning. The world just continues without us. That's the first implication of that little phrase. And I think the second one would be this. He's saying, not only do we leave the earth behind us, but we will take no earthly possession with us. That's what he's trying to tell us, the man who had everything. That's the reason why you never see a funeral hearse towing a U-Haul trailer to the cemetery, right? I remember not that long ago, I did an open casket memorial service right here in this room. The reason I can remember it so clearly is that we don't do those very often anymore. It's kind of an old traditional way of funerals and memorial service, and it kind of surprised me when this memorial service um, had an open casket. <clears throat> it was right here in front of me. <clears throat> the deceased man was an unbeliever, but to his credit, he had a lot of friends. And at the end of an open casket memorial service, if you've never been to one, the tradition is that everyone who's there will file into the, the aisle and you walk past and pay your respects to the deceased as you go out into the lobby and the service ends. Well, at this one, tradition holds that the the pastor, the officiant, which would have been me, is I'm standing here at the head of the casket while it's right next to me and as people are walking by. And this guy had some friends. Several of his buddies came up towards the end of that receiving line and he, 
what they did is they placed a, a really nice fishing rod and reel in the casket, along with an expensive cigar. As if to say to their deceased friend, wherever you're going, be happy. Keep on fishing, buddy, and light one up for us. And I couldn't help but notice that that was a Lama glass fishing pole and a Shimano 3000 reel. <laughs> and all I could think about was how I was going to get that rod and reel and the cigar out of that casket before we got the body to the cemetery. I'm up here. Tears are flowing down my face. They're thinking I'm weeping for the guy. I'm wanting, that's $500 worth of gear. I, I was tempted to volunteer to ride in the back of the hearse on the way to the cemetery. I resisted. I resisted. But how sad. Solomon's point is this. Many will tragically try their whole life to capture a happiness from this world that lasts. My point is that sadly, some people will even try to send pieces of this world on ahead to the next in desperate hopes that happiness can finally be captured there. And Solomon is saying here in this first point, all of that's vanity. It's meaningless. Second, Solomon is teaching us in this first chapter that even creation is constantly telling us to stop looking to this world for meaning and happiness. And we see here in verses five through eight that Solomon studied the sun, the wind, and the seas. And he's hoping that the creation would provide him with some answers, with life's meaning and ultimate happiness. What he discovered instead was the exact opposite. In verse five, he studied the sun and he noticed that it sets every night and rises every morning and it never rests in between. Always heading to rise or to set again, always leaving us to return to the same place in which it came. And then it dawned on Solomon, no pun intended, that right when you start to feel the warmth of happiness, it leaves and goes back into the dark where it came from. And then he studied the wind. And he's basically describing here that the wind shifts. It shifts its direction and its starting point. But we never know where it comes from or where it's going. And right when you figure that out, it blows to or from another place. And then he talks about the streams. And he says, all the streams eventually run to the sea. They run to the sea from above ground and then somehow it comes back to the, to the stream again underground in this continual cycle or circulation, always filling but never full. Solomon realized that all of these are God's messages showing us that our pursuit of a godless happiness is as futile as trying to knock the sun off its course or to redirect the wind or to fill up the ocean. And I thought, what, is this, what does this mean to us today? I, I, I'm probably stretching the application of this, but when I think of Solomon studying the sun, the star, I think of people who are constantly turning to astronomy or, or the horoscopes to figure out what their life's going to be like in the future or what, what's it going to be like now. When he, when he studies the, uh, the wind, I think of mysticism and, and all the mystics and the people who are, are, are reading and searching all of these made up weird things about where we go and where we don't go and what happens to us and the soul travel throughout the universe that we all just float around forever. And it's so nonsensical and it goes, it ends up just spinning you in circles. This whole creation is a gift from God actually. Creation exists in this meaningless routine as it always has, never at rest, never contented. And as vast and as powerful as the sun and the ocean and the climate are, they have no power to explain to us what our lives are about or to give us any happiness or meaning. Thirdly, there are no new discoveries waiting to prove this wrong. There's nothing left to invent that will keep us happy, okay? In verses 9 through 11, 
Solomon in his brilliance. He says, think about this. All has already been done and tried. There's nothing new. And I was thinking about all the major discoveries and inventions over the last couple of centuries that all had incredible promise to make us happier and better and wonderful and content and things like electricity, things like indoor plumbing and automobiles and air travel and computers and cell phones and air conditioners and artificial intelligence and cameras, you name it, on and on and on the list goes, all promising to make this life more fulfilling and content. You name it. Solomon noticed that up until every point in time, everything has already been. So right now, at this point in time, everything that has been invented has already been invented, and here we are as a world, as a humanity, still trying to get to lasting happiness. Every fashion, every philosophy, every theory, every expression of self has a shelf life. And then it circles back again in a new generation under a new label. From the theory of evolution to the critical race theory, they are at best another desperate attempt of man to shine new light on the same old desperate hope. World, where is my happiness? World, where is my contentment? World, where is my peace? Where is my fulfillment? Where is my meaning? Where is my purpose? Where do I find it and how do I keep it? So under the sun, this world is not sufficient to make a lasting happiness for us. This weary world is never going to be kinder to us than it's been to those who have gone before us. And so we have to look above the sun for a new life and a new world. And I hope that this makes us appreciate the gospel of Jesus more than ever. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reminds us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly or to the full. And it's this abundant life and this coming new world that puts the song in our mouths every Sunday, right? It's this new life in Christ and this promise of what's ahead that makes us sing. Because in heaven, all will be new. And that newness starts right now with our hearts. Jesus said this in, to, uh, in Revelation 21. John has a vision of heaven. And Jesus tells him to write it down. And so John writes this. And he who was seated on the throne said, that's Jesus, Behold, I am making all things new. Write it down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, John said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Heaven, completely unlike the present state of our contentment, thirsty, happy, thirsty world. Heaven is untouched and uncorrupted by sin's greatest tragedy upon the human heart. Do you know what sin's greatest tragedy upon the human heart actually is? Here's the tragedy of sin. It always convinces us to dethrone God and enthrone self. It always convinces us to push God down, to push God out, to push God away, and to elevate ourselves to the center of our existence and our purpose and our happiness. And as soon as that happens, all hope of happiness is lost. Unless our sin is forgiven and removed and God is rightly rethroned upon the new heart that's been freed from sin. And that's exactly what has happened to us. Jesus is the only one who can do that. The S-O-N son is infinitely above the S-U-N son. And so we look to the son. We no longer expect from this world what it's powerless to provide. Our world is just a constant reminder that our time on earth is not, com is not the complete story of our lives. This is not all there is. 
Jesus saved us so that we can know and enjoy God and live forever with him. Amen? And so, how do we go to heaven? How did we receive this living water of a truly meaningful and happy life? Christian, I want to remind you. Close your eyes just for a minute. Just quietly and gently. Just close your eyes and listen to what has happened and how it happened to so many of us. Here's how it happened. We admitted that we've dethroned God. We've admitted that we're sinners. And we admitted that we desperately needed forgiveness. And that may have been the whole, the hardest part of the whole journey. We had to admit. We've been trying, we had been trying or wanting to live life with ourselves on the throne and God somewhere else. That started our journey. But from there, we decided to believe that Jesus died on the cross for us, for you, for me. We understood and we believed that his death on the cross was about him taking all of God's coming wrath and judgment upon himself that was really supposed to come upon our sin. Jesus willingly and sacrificed, willingly and sacrificially stood between us and the coming wrath and judgment and condemnation and punishment of God that's coming against all sin. And Jesus willingly took our punishment for us, and we believe that. And then we received Jesus through faith putting all of our trust in him, asking him and only him to be our savior and our Lord. And in that moment of faith, that moment of stepping over the line, the power of God was enforced and our sin was removed. And our hearts were made righteous through faith in the righteous one, Jesus Christ. And ever since that point, God has been preparing us and changing us and conforming us and transforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, healing our hearts from sin, giving us new hope. And so we sit here today and we once again are reminded that because we trust in him, We will not be shaken. Because we put our lives in the firm grip of God's love. We are always on a firm foundation. Oh, Heavenly Father. Words are not enough to say thank you. Words are not enough. So we lift up our praise and we lift up our hearts and we tell you again, thank you. Thank you. Stand and sing with me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say yes. Worthy of every breath we could ever be. We live for you.
Lord, we surrender to you. We build our lives upon you. You are our only firm foundation. Lord, change us from the inside out in every way to be more like you. I will build my life upon your love. Sing it. It almost feels like Solomon's writing that song, albeit coming at it from a really weird direction. (laughs) But that's the thread that he's weaving through this whole confession. There's only one place to put our trust. And when it's there, we don't have to be shaken. 
The firmest foundation in the world for you to live your life on is on the foundation that God loves you. Some of you have never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ. You've never admitted you have kicked God off the throne of your life a long time ago. You've never admitted your greatest need is not happiness. Right now, it's forgiveness. And that's what God has to offer. And when that happens, and you put your faith in what Jesus Christ did to secure your forgiveness, that's when everything changes. And you look at the world a little differently. And you realize that this life isn't all there is, praise God. In just a moment, I'll close, and there'll be some people standing up here. If you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ, we want to help you take that step of faith. We just want to pray for you before you go home. And maybe you need prayer this week. Maybe there's some stuff coming up that's just super heavy, and you need someone else to just pray for you before you leave the room. We'd be glad to do that as well. Father, our lives are yours. This world is yours. You are on the throne. We trust you. We need you and we love you. And we pray, God, that if there are any opportunities to somehow share these truths with people around us who are so hurting, God, give us the courage and give us the words that so perfectly explain why we put our trust in you. It's because of you we've gathered and prayed and worshiped. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you next Sunday.